Hi, it's the boy Blackbeard Mirage, the professor. You tuned in for a Midnight Mirage University class. I salute to everybody out there viewing these tapes. Staying down to come up, staying on your square, keeping your integrity, and keeping your head up high in these, you know, challenging times that we all are living in. I got nothing but love for you. And, um, you know, just keep on moving forward in your life, all right? Today we're going to talk about the Civil War, the American Civil War, or as I like to call it, the Aboriginal Civil War. This is also going to tie into the American Revolutionary tapes that I made in the past. So we're going to go into this Civil War mystery because it's a certain amount of information that was left out. And it was left out because it was very critical to our awakening. All right. When it comes to the Civil War, you have two perspectives. You have the European perspective and you have the Aboriginal perspective. All right. Now, because we were told that we were from so-called Africa, we missed out on the Aboriginal perspective, which is actually our history and our story. All right. So that's what we're going to do in this tape. We're going to talk about the Civil War, but from the Aboriginal perspective. All right. I first want to shout out the brother, I see the Duke of Tears, because he put out a lot of good information dealing with the American Revolution, also dealing with the Civil War. And um, his studies and his work actually um, helped me in, in my own understanding. So I want to salute him. And we need to get ready to go into this information. All right. The first thing I'm going to read is a small brief article that was put out by the Sons of the Confederate, the Veterans Education Committee. All right. Sons of the Confederate Education Committee, Veterans Education Committee. Excuse me. Before I go deep into this tape, um, one of the con one of the misconceptions we're going to break in this is, is that they told us that the American Civil War was involving European Caucasians from the north fighting European Caucasians in the South. And they taught us that the main reason these two were fighting was to see who would have, you know, ownership over the so-called slave. Or basically they try to tell you that it was over, you know, freeing so-called slaves or freeing so-called black people. That is actually one of the deceptions that we're going to clear up in this tape. All right. So the first thing is, is that, you know, we're going to tackle that misunderstanding. Another thing is, is that I've noticed when it comes to the Confederate side of the Civil War, they usually only show you the poor white trash that was working on the civil, working on behalf of the Confederacy. And they show you a lot of the European Caucasians that were, you know, fighting for their own freedom and for their own, I guess, what they supposed to be their rights. But one of the biggest atom bombs to a lot of this, and even to myself when I found this information out, is that most of the Confederate, you know, we could say, heritage actually was of the aboriginal people so when it comes to that confederate flag even we might want to get ready to do a little digger deeping because digger uh dig a little bit deeper excuse me because that confederate flag is not just associated with these european caucasians that came to the south all right that confederate flag also was in association with a lot of the aboriginals here so as we're going to see a little bit today man we're going to talk about some stuff that some of us may have known, some of us may have not known, but it's, it'll be good to still clear it up. And this article that I'm about to read was put out by the Sons of the Confederate, like I said, the Veterans Education Committee, because a lot of the people you still see hold up the Confederate flag today that may be of a European Caucasian persuasion. These people are claiming to be descendants of, you know, the Caucasians that fought in the Civil War. And through a lot of emotional sorcery and a lot of media play and a lot of slave movies, they have made the melanated people of America hate the Confederacy and hate the Confederate flag. Um, even myself, you know, before me learning everything that I'm supposed to learn, supposed to have learned, you know, even I didn't quite understand the um, full history behind the Confederacy. All right. So we're going to clear a little bit up, clear a little bit of that up. All right. First thing I'm reading, like I told you, is the Sons of Confederate Veterans Education Committee. They put out an article. And it talks about the American Indians in the Civil War. All right. The American Indians in the Civil War. So we're going to read through it and then we're going to you know, analyze as usual. Also, when you hear me say the war between the states, this is talking about the Civil War. Also, when you hear me use the word Indian, American Indian or any of the various tribes of so-called Native Americans, these are all melanated Aboriginal indigenous so-called black people. But you also going to hear me refer to them as Aboriginal Moors, because that would be a little more, um, what's the word, consistent with how these people were documented in legal 
and governmental and constitutional documents before the Reconstruction era when history was actually um, rewritten. All right. So you go if you hear me say Moors, if you hear me say Aboriginals, if you hear me say Autonctons, I'm talking about the same people, melanated so-called black people in America. All right. So let's go into this thing. After the civil, excuse me, after the war between the states began, President Jefferson Davis addressed the Congress of the Confederate States of America to establish a Bureau of Indian Affairs. While the North was apathetic concerning the plight of American Indians, the South determinately created a positive relationship with Indian country. So the first thing is, is that the so-called president of the European side of the Confederacy was this guy named Jefferson Davis. You know, most of you all may have heard about him through history. And they are already telling you right here that Jefferson Davis saw it to be very important to create an alliance with the aboriginal American Indians in the South. And whereas you had the Europeans in the North um, under the United States, we'll just say they didn't so called they didn't too much care about trying to um, have a positive relationship with these aboriginal Indians. So the first, you know, key right here is, is that the Southern Confederate Europeans actually tried to um, meet up with some of these aboriginals to come to some kind of agreement. All right. This is before the war. In May 1861, Confederate envoy Albert Pike arrived in Indian country so that he could negotiate treaty terms with American Indians who were originally from the South. Pike found that most Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, and Seminole allied themselves with the Confederacy, but Cherokees were conflicted and bitterly divided just as the Europeans. So they're also giving you another key. A lot of you all have heard about the, um, the, the, the freed and accepted Mason, Albert Pike. Albert Pike was a, in, in the Caucasian individual involved in the Civil War or, you know, the Confederacy on the South. But the part that they are telling you is, is that Albert Pike was actually trained by a lot of the Aboriginal Moors or Aboriginal Indians in the South. And he was given tools to be successful by some of these people. So the first thing you need to realize is, is that a lot of the aboriginals in the South were, for lack of a better word, um, assisting some of these Europeans because the Civil War involved a lot of conflicts. It was Europeans fighting Europeans. It was aboriginals fighting aboriginals. And then it was aboriginals fighting Europeans. So when we say the Civil War, it includes all three of those battles. And when you have a war going on, you know, when two people have, let's say, a common enemy they will come together on certain agreements so when you hear that the confederacy is trying to come together with these american indians it's because the united states was a whole different faction separate faction from a lot of these you can say caucasians you know in the south all right so they were trying to create their own jurisdiction and create their own you know nation and country for themselves um, a lot of the other problems in the civil war you'll hear about the federal and state conflicts where the states were saying they had certain states rights and the federal government trying to override those states rights. So all this ties into it. Let's continue. The Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek and Seminoles were not the only native groups in the war between the states or the Civil War. Many American Indians fought on both sides of the war, such as the Caddoes, Delaware, Kickapoo, Miami, Osagi, Potawatomi, Quapaws, Shawnee, and Wichita or Washita's. The pro-Union Pimas in Arizona Territory successfully routed Confederate forces. American Indians were located east of the Mississippi River. Choctaws who lived in Mississippi formed a battalion. Other American Indian Confederates were from Tennessee, North Carolina, and Kentucky. So, let's go over this last little part. So, it's telling you right now that you had a collective, you know, multiple nations that came, you know, to actually hold up the Confederate flag and fight for the freedom because the Confederate flag really is, is a symbol for freedom. Um, not only, you know, the, the freedom that the Caucasians are trying to get for themselves, but also the freedom that the aboriginals are trying to carve out for themselves. Because you got to remember that this is their land. All right. So Albert Pike and the other Confederates that tried to come to Indian Territory and create treaties and agreements with these people is because they knew that they were on their land and they were trying to at least carve out, you know, some little property that they could be on, um, you know, and there won't be no conflict with these Indians. All right. Let me read a few of these other 
native tribes. So they say that during the Civil War, you had varieties of native tribes fighting on both sides. Some of them were fighting on the side of the United States or what they call the people from the north, the Yankees. And some of them were fighting on the Confederacy, which were basically the aboriginals in the south and the indentured servitude class and the indentured, uh, not indentured, and the slave class of white pilgrims that were working on the plantations in the south. Some of these various natives were the Asogi, Asagi, excuse me, Miami, Delaware, Kickapoo, Cadoz, Shawnee, etc., so when you think about these Native American or Aboriginal tribes, there were actually hundreds, if not thousands of them. So just because somebody says American Indian or Aboriginal more or Autonkton is more, you know, well, what tribe necessarily were you from? Because there were a lot of them. So myself, for example, I'm an Aboriginal more, but on my mother's side, I come from the Blackfoot side of that's the Native tribe I come from on my mother's, the Blackfoot, you know. So I would be an Aboriginal more via Blackfoot tribe on my maternal line. All right. So that's why they have these different names. And it said that, you know, most of these um, American Confederates or excuse me, American Indian Confederates, they were from Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina, Kentucky, Florida, etc. So the first thing we just broke, the key we just broke open is, is that most of the Aboriginal Moors in the South during the Civil War were fighting on the Confederate side, not necessarily to help the Caucasians, but to help themselves. And they came under the banner of one flag. Now, more than likely, as far as who created the flag, I don't have the history on that right now. You know, I don't know necessarily if the Europeans created it, but more than likely the aboriginals created that stuff. Because these foreign Europeans really learned everything they knew from the aboriginal. So I highly doubt that they even created that concept of that flag. All right. Because when you look at the Confederate flag... It's kind of synonymous and it looks a lot like the Great Britain flag or the British flag or the Brutish flag. And we know those were some Moors because King George III, which is who they were trying to fight to get released from. He was a Moor. All right. So we're just making that association. All right. So whites were slaves during the 17 and 1800s in America. And they had their own interest in the Civil War for their own freedom, just like in the American Revolution years prior. All right. Now I want to read in a book called The Forgotten Cause of the Civil War, a new look at the slavery issue. It's called The Forgotten Cause of the Civil War, a new look at the slavery issue by Lawrence Tenzer. By Lawrence Tenzer, The Forgotten Cause of the Civil War. If you want to purchase this book, you can find it for $795 on Amazon. The Forgotten Cause of the Civil War, a new look at the slavery issue by Lawrence Tenzer. For $795 on Amazon. Um, personally, I do plan on purchasing this book, but right now I'm going to read a customer review or or a or a um a review that somebody has already bought the book. They read the book and they left a summary of it on Amazon. And I basically want to read what this person wrote because it gives us an overall um overview of the book because I don't have it in front of me right now. Let's go into this. Tenzer, Tenzer, the author, shows that the white Southern slaves produced a. Let me read. Tenzer shows that the white Southern slaves produced a combination of racial mixture, and the maternal descent rule were viewed as white people by Northerners, who had good reason to fear that any white person, mixed or pure, could be kidnapped by slave catchers and sold into slavery in the South. So the first thing is, is that this book is going into how. You had so-called Europeans or so-called white people in the South, and they were actually in slavery. All right, let's continue. Tenzer destroys the argument of those neo-Confederates who contend that the southern states called the slave power in the North were merely resisting the tyranny of a federal government. Because a lot of these Confederate, you know, Caucasians you see today, they say that, well, we were just fighting for states' rights and we were just fighting for our own freedom. That's part of it, but they ain't telling you the whole story. They're not telling you how they actually were slaves during this time. And they were fighting to get out of slavery. The slave power effectively controlled Congress and the presidency for most of the antebellum period. The three-fifths rule gave congressmen from the state slave states the right to represent people who obviously couldn't vote, thereby giving them far more power than they would have received if they had been limited to the representing free persons. So right now they're talking about the three-fifths compromise and how they were counting, you know, 
representatives in the state to see how many seats they could actually hold in the Senate and hold in the House of Rep in Washington, D.C. All right. So think about this so-called plantation owner. And let's say they had 30 so-called slaves on their plantation. Now, mind you, these slaves have no rights. They can't vote. They can't really even represent themselves. But what the South was having the ability to do was they were allowed, they were counting those people to basically have more influence when it came to Congress. Because if it's showing that, well, on this plantation, it's 31 people, one is free and 30 of them are slaves, but they're counting 31 people when it came to the House of Reps. So you could see how the control in Congress was basically mainly the slave power or basically the people who were slave apologists, everybody who was investing in the slavery. They were controlling Congress at a certain point in time. Because they were holding all the seats because of the population in the South. This is actually some of the conflict that came and some of the initial problems. Free states exercise slave rights by passing personal liberty laws to nullify the effect of the fugitive slave law. This law gave the accused slave no rights to bring witnesses, have a jury or any other form of due process. The judge was authorized by the law to receive a larger fee. If he ruled against the slave, then if he ruled in his favor. Tenzer also showed that when you consider the low wages of the average southern white male, coupled with the sharp rising in slave prices, slave catching was a tempting business. The slave catcher would earn more with one kidnapping expedition than he could earn by a year or two of hard labor. So the next thing they're saying right here is, is that Tenzer or the author is also showing you how in the South during these times that the average Southern white male received low wages and that the slave prices were extremely high. So, you know how they try to tell you that during the so-called South or slavery period, they just try to paint this picture in your mind that it was just all these free white people, you know, that had nice little carriages. They women wearing nice dresses, all these white people owning plantations and just a bunch of Negro slaves working on these plantations. That's the picture that they try to show you in movies and in history. But what this author is showing you is, is that during that time, majority of the white males in the South were poor. As I told you on previous tapes, they were actually pilgrims themselves working on plantation farms. But when the slave shit was going on, a lot of those poor whites didn't even have opportunities for work because the slaves were providing free labor. So you had a lot of poor whites in the South that not only were working, they, they had no job. And on top of that, they were poor. So how are they owning plantations and owning slaves? OK. And it says right here that these same white Southern slaves, slave or uh, these Southern white males, excuse me, because they were so poor, they actually started getting into the slave kidnapping to ex make some money. Because like I'm telling you right now, if they having aboriginals that they stole and put them in slavery. They have Europeans that they put in slavery. These Caucasian males who are free are seeing that, wait a minute, we already broke as fuck. So if we want to get in on some money, let's go try to kidnap some European mixed looking people, some European women or possibly some aboriginals that don't have their paperwork together. Let's try to kidnap them and sell them into slavery. And that's what was going on. I never saw the movie 12 Years a Slave. But I heard that that movie was basically about that. It was a guy who was actually free. It was a melanated man who was actually free, but he was actually kidnapped and thrown into slavery. See, this is what was going on a lot of the times. I'm telling you all right now, most aboriginal people, most of us so-called black people. All of us were not actually enslaved, like all of our ancestors were not slaves. You know, they want to make you think that every so-called black person here was a slave. That's not true. You know, I'm led to believe that it was a small percentage of them that were actually slaves. So this is what you need to put in your head. During the time of the Civil War, there were probably more free aboriginals that was fighting to stay free than there were actually being captured and thrown into slave camps and things of this nature. And you had just as many European Caucasians in slavery that, that, that you did melanated people in slavery. All right. So during the times of slavery, you had free aboriginals and you had free Europeans, but you also had enslaved or prisoner of war aboriginals and you had slave or Slav Europeans during the Civil War. So a lot of this was to free themselves from this shit. That's the part they're not telling you in history books. Let's continue. 
Many liberal historians ask why Northern whites would fight a civil war to free blacks that they didn't consider equal. The obvious answer is they saw slavery as a threat to whites. There was not only the issue of the white slaves, but the constant denigration of a free society by the intellectual defenders of slavery. Let me pause right here. So they're telling you why the person is saying, why would northern whites, OK, who are already free themselves, why would they want to come to the south and free some Negroes that they didn't even consider to be human? You got to think about that. Why would these same white people who just hated black people so much? Why would they go into a bloody war and kill each other just to see, you know, if we can free the so-called black people? What I'm telling you right now is that most of the European conflicts you saw during the Civil War when they was fighting each other, these were either political um, or some kind of Congress type of conflicts. OK, now I'm not saying that they weren't fighting over who would be able to try to rule over the Negro, because I actually state that in my book that you see in front of you. During the Civil War, you did have Europeans fighting each other because they wanted to see, well, who's going to be able to rule over the Negro? Is it going to be the Yankee Caucasian from the South? I mean, from the north, rather, or is it going to be the Caucasian from the south? So you did have some of them conflicting each other on that. But most of the conflict Europeans had with each other during the Civil War were basically over Congress type of stuff. You know, these seats in the House of Representatives and that type of conflict, it really had nothing to do with the black people. So that's a misconception, you know, that they were fighting the free black people. That's a lie. Another problem during this time was is that the slave thing was starting to get a little bit too big because... Most aboriginal people here were living under a free society prior to these foreigners showing up. We were living in a Garden of Eden type of life. This slavery that you see was actually an extension of the Brutish Empire, and it was an extension of our Osman or Ottoman relatives across the Atlantic. Now, they were into the slavery shit very, very big. So when you hear about the Barbary Coast Wars, when you hear about... um you know, the Barbary states capturing these different Europeans from these different islands in southern um, in Europe and then putting them in slavery. When you hear about the Moorish harems and stuff like that, a lot of that stuff was our ancestors across the waters. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that they didn't bring these practices over here. And I'm not going to say that you didn't have aboriginal people here doing the same stuff. Yes, you did. You had aboriginal Moors here that were owning their own plantations and they had their own Caucasian slaves on those plantations. And those aboriginal Moors was actually buying those Caucasian slaves from Moors that were bringing them across the waters. So the whole slave story about all these people on boats and stuff of that nature, they really kind of got it backwards. Like a lot of these were actually Europeans on these boats and they were brought over here by these Ottoman Moors. OK, and they were selling them to aboriginal Moors that were already here. So that's how you have Caucasians here. Most of you Caucasian people, if you all didn't come over here, if your ancestors didn't come over here probably in like the 1800s and stuff like that. If they were here prior to that, more than likely they were slaves. All right. So that's the best majority of you all. OK, majority of you all that are Caucasian, your ancestors were slaves. All right. So it's time to bite the bullet and it's time to go ahead and accept that. But one thing that was going on here is, is that we had a form of a republic here. Um, now, when I say republic, don't think Republican Party. Think more like a bunch of nobles and a bunch of sovereigns. And them basically collectively coming together under a union, all right, or, or a common republic. And this is actually an extension of divine law or natural law or cosmic law. So, you know, when you had this slave system going on, it's starting to threaten that. When you see it's a society where people being stolen just because somebody broke and they feel like I want to make some money. So they just stealing people and throwing them into slavery. You got to remember that this shit was happening to Europeans and it was happening to Aboriginal Americans. So Congress was starting to see like, wait a minute. Yes, I know we're capturing these aboriginal Indians and throwing them in slavery, but it's also a lot of our own people being thrown into it, and particularly our European women. So Congress was like, yeah, we need to do something about that. All right. And that's what they mean by the constant denigration of a free society by the intellectual defenders of slavery, because you had some people that was profiting off of the slavery. And they was like, no, nah, this shit popping like we ain't freeing nobody. But then you had people saying like, no, nah, we got to free these people, both European and melanated, because if we don't, the whole society is going to collapse. All right. Why? How do I know this is true? Because the ancient Emerald Tablet, Tablets of Foth, it talks about an aboriginal empire coming up in the West and how all the different nations and societies of people will be able to live in harmony or in peace 
in the West. All right. That that is that's talking about the American Republic. All right. So the American Republic was actually prophesized way back in the times of Atlantis. So they already knew that over here it wasn't supposed to be all that slavery and shit like that. People were supposed to be able to come over here. If they came here, they were supposed to come here with the permission of aboriginals, you know, live in their own little area and stuff like that. Practice their own form of religion and basically be able to live your own type of life without anybody bothering you. OK, but when you have constant slavery and people being kidnapped, that is threatening the society as a whole. All right. Let's continue. Slavery apologists constantly stated that their slaves were better off than free than free white laborers in the north. More than that, the pro-slavery intellectuals defended slavery as good in and of itself, regardless of race and color. I'll repeat more than that. The pro-slavery intellectuals defended slavery as a good in and of itself, regardless of race and color. So you had people that were both Europeans and aboriginal melanated people that said, we don't give a fuck if you white or black. This slavery shit is popping. We making a lot of money and we ain't trying to stop this shit. So that's another misconception that just because you were melanated, that meant you immediately was a slave. That's another lie. Let's continue. Tenzer shows that the Republican Party political literature of the antebellum period took the threat of white enslavement seriously. One final praise. Tenzer de defines his terms well. He reminds us that the slave power of the South represented planter elite and not Southern people in general. Let me repeat. Tenzer defines his terms well. He reminds us that the slave power of the South represented the planter elite and not Southern people in general. So when you hear about the South and when they talk about slave owners, plantation owners, planter owners and all this different stuff, this is not necessarily talking about Caucasian people. They're talking about planter elitists. Now, let me ask you this. If the aboriginal people are from this continent, they own the continent and the land before anybody arrived here. Who more than likely was majority of the planter owner class? It more than likely was more melanated people that owned these plantations than it was Caucasian people. So during the so-called slave period, you had a lot of melanated people that owned their own plantations. Now, they probably did have some so-called black people on them plantations. I'm not saying that we didn't fuck each other over. We did a little bit of that. But that con that misconception of thinking that it was just Caucasian people that owned plantations, that's a lie. It's not true. You got to think about it. If the if Moors were from here and they already owned the land, they already had their own homes, they had their own plantations, they had their own crops, they had their own farms. Why are you led to believe that these Caucasians were just able to come here and just what kicked them out of their houses and now they own a plantation. Now, this shit didn't go like that. You had a lot of homeless ass, barbarian ass Caucasian people who were trying to infiltrate these Moors land that were aboriginal. All right. Now, some of them probably stole plantations from some of these people, uh, et cetera. But just think about that. Like if the aboriginals were from here, they were already growing crops. They taught the European about corn and stuff when he came here. Why are you led to believe that the European now all of a sudden? is the sole owner of all plantations and all crops. That's not true. Also, Negro blood by itself did not confine anyone to slavery. If the maternal descent line was from a white female or had been broken by manumission, the descendants were free. Southern white persons could legally have more Negro ancestry than some unfortunate slaves. Let me repeat. Also, Negro blood by itself did not confine anyone to slavery. If the maternal descent line was from a white female or had been broken by manumission, the descendants were free. Southern white persons could legally have more Negro ancestry than some unfortunate slaves. So that's right here. It's just broke a key. So they telling you right now that Negro blood did not just confine you to slavery. So it didn't matter if you was melanated. That didn't mean you was automatically thrown in slavery. And it's also saying that if you were so-called Caucasian or so-called mixed. It says that if the maternal line was from a white female or had been broken by manumission, the descendants were free. So let me ask you this then. So how can a person have Negro blood, but at the same time, the maternal line is from a Caucasian female? What is that telling you? That means that the paternal line or the father line came from melanated or black blood. Man, let me repeat this shit. Y'all don't hear me. 
If the maternal descent line was from a white female, the descendants were free. But how can they have Negro blood if the maternal line is from a white female? That means that the father had to been black. More than likely, more than likely that father or that aboriginal melanated man also owned property. OK, so that's telling you right here that you had people around at that time that had white mothers and black fathers. And if they had a white mother, more than likely they, they could be considered free. But if they had a white father. They could possibly be thrown into slavery. You see the trick right there? You see the trick? They didn't say like they didn't say if the if the paternal line was from a white male that a descendant was free. They said if the maternal line was from a white female, the descendants were free. So why didn't they bring the white male up? Because most of the white males were poor. This is what I'm trying to tell you. They were poor. So all they did was a trade places. You see how the so-called black man today, everybody think that we broke and we don't have this and we don't have that. That was the white man at some point, not too long ago. And at that time, when the white man was poor, all the melanated men actually were wealthy and rich. And they had white women that they were having children with. And those mixed women, I mean, those mixed children that were coming from the white mother and black father, a lot of them were being kidnapped and thrown into slavery. But you had people in the north that were white, but they could they considered those mixed people who had white mothers as white. So the Civil War was to actually free those people and to increase the white population. All right. This is why you see during these times, it was a lot of European women being stolen. A lot of the slavery and a lot of the kidnapping was European women. Um, and they were actually thrown into slavery by their own white men. Yes. You had a lot of Caucasian women being thrown into slavery by their own white men. You would have a Caucasian male who was poor. He would go and find a Caucasian woman. Kidnap her, hit her in the head, take that Caucasian woman to some aboriginal melanated man who owned property, sell him to that man. That man would give that Caucasian some money. This is how the shit was going down. So we just went into a writer review and this was written in July 22nd, 1998. And I just wanted to read over that um, real quick and to wrap it up. The three fifths compromise, 1787. The United States Constitutional Convention, the debate was over whether and if so, how slaves would be counted by determining a state's population for legislative representation and taxing purposes, determining the number of seats that the state would have in the United States House of Representatives for the next 10 years. So when you have these people in the South trying to include all these slaves that don't even have rights, the folks in the North was like, wait a minute, you can't count all these slaves just because you got them on your plantation, but they don't even have rights. People in the South was saying, like, well, we own them. People in the North was like, yeah, you own them, but you all are taking a majority of the seats in the House of Representatives. And every 10 years go by, it's like it just keep being y'all over and over and over.